60. Flex students range, and the flex program means you just meet on weekends and an occasional weekday for my particular program. You can have anywhere from 10, and the newest class has up to about 35. Most PT programs, so if you apply to Chapman, Loma Linda, anything like that, most of the average class size is going to be around 50 to 60 students, give or take about 10, depending on the school. And how many, um, how many students do you guys accept every year? I was asking to see you about that. You guys accept. Um, you guys are accepting at St. Augustine. There's, there's a, except or there's a regular program and decelerated, right? And so there's a bunch of different kind of cohorts you can jump in. But they're accepting thirty students or so every three months. So the University of St. Augustine, as far as I know, is the only school that does applications and they accept students in the fall, the spring, and the summer. The University of St. Augustine has two different programs. They have a full-time accelerated program, which means that actually you complete school faster than most DPT programs, which are three years. You actually finish in about two and a half now. Um, in that program, they accept, like I said, students in the fall, spring, and summer. They cap out at about 60 students. So every fall, spring, and summer, they accept another 60 students. Most universities, like if you go to USC or Chapman, most will only have admissions only once a year, typically in the fall. However, I do know that Chapman did just start now accepting summer applications, so I know some universities are starting to accept applications twice a year. But like I said, the average class size for that is typically around 60, give or take 10 to 20 students. Um, I know Long Beach is a little bit less. They maybe have 40 students. Yeah, summer, I think, still down at like, between 32 and 48. Yeah. I know Long Beach, um, they're one of the lower students. They're in like the low 40s, maybe high 30s. USC, I know it's about 90. But I'm just using an average about 60 students based on, I know Chapman goes up for 55. I've got a couple of students, uh, Nathan, that um, actually some of which you might know that are you know applying for the second year around. And I'm actually encouraging them to apply to St. Augustine because I think that with the number of students that are being accepted, there's a better chance. I think the other big thing too with St. Augustine, there's um, a couple folks that I know that went to St. Augustine's program back out in Florida, and also the one here, and they're sort of known for some of their manual techniques, right? Yes, yeah, so each school, you're always gonna have a core curriculum, so you're obviously gonna take courses in anatomy, physiology, um, neurology classes, stuff like that, but then after you get into about your Later on in towards your second year, you can some universities will start focusing more on research based where they want you to go into research and go into the lab and perform research. Where other universities, where for example the University of St. Augustine, they're gonna have a lot more classes that are hands-on, meaning you're gonna go and work individually one-on-one -on -one with other students for hip injuries, knee injuries, spine injuries, arm injuries, and work on actual manual techniques where other schools will say, okay, what is the pathology or what is wrong with the specific tissues and what are these interventions that I can do to help treat that and do research on that. So they'll look at all these people in an acute care hospital and say, okay, these patients with this hip injury were treated this way, these patients with the same hip injury were treated this way, who had the better outcomes and they're going to do research on that. There's no right or wrong, it just kind of depends on what you want to get more interested in. Do you want to be more in the research aspect of it? which is perfectly fine, or if you want to be more into the actual manual, hands-on, working one-on-one -on -one with the patient aspect of it. Both are great fields. There's no right or wrong one. Um, what I will say about graduate school, though, is you basically are just going to have tests every week. So, you know, you'll have a test in one class one week and then in another class another week, and you really just don't get a break. For PT school, with any university, your first semester, I mean, you're going to take anatomy, physiology, some ethics courses, maybe some critical writing courses. You probably have about five or six courses every semester. You're going to have about a 17-week unit course load. So just a quick show of hands, how many of you have taken anatomy or physiology? OK. If you have taken that, it's going to go quite a bit more detailed than that. 
So just expect the same course load that you did in those classes with a little bit more in detail on that with an additional 10 units on top. So that's just, I think it's better off knowing what to actually expect to go into PT school. And same thing with OT school and nursing or most graduate professional schools. You're better off knowing what you're getting yourself into than I've seen a lot of students that really didn't know what to expect and they got into their first semester and just were overwhelmed and not prepared. So you're better off like getting your foundation now. So doing really well in those anatomy, physiology courses, that's your foundation. Your grad school is going to expect that you have that foundation and then they're going to build upon it. So my recommendation is definitely keep reviewing on those topics, especially for OT, PT, nursing, all of those. Um, a little bit about my path. So one of the reasons that I chose physical therapy is because it's very diverse, kind of like OT, where there's a variety of settings that you can work in. So when most people think of physical therapy, like outside of this class, they just think, oh, you work with a sports professional and some athlete got an ACL injury and you're just going to rehab them. When in real life, a big portion of physical therapy is actually acute care working with geriatric patients or total hip patients, total knee patients, patients with cardiac problems or lung problems. And there's a whole separate entity that's totally separated from the sports aspect of it, which most people don't know about. Um, neurological patients, as the previous person just came in, you're going to work with stroke patients, neurological patients, traumatic brain injuries, all of that type of stuff. Um, so I think that's also important to know where physical therapy and occupational therapy are not just geared towards like, the sports aspect of it. On that note, I know I'm kind of jumping around, but if you are applying to PT or OT school, I know in this class um, you have the opportunity to work with individuals with strokes and neurological impairments and work with them in the aquatic setting. If you're applying to graduate school, um, all graduate schools for physical therapy are gonna require some sort of observational hours. And every single person that I've ever spoken to, they all have their minimum requirements done in the outpatient physical therapy. When you're applying to graduate school, you want something that's gonna separate you and set you apart. So working with these populations in an aquatic setting or working with neurological patients or patients with stroke or cardiovascular injuries, that's going to set you apart than just every other person who all worked in outpatient physical therapy. So what I did is, this is actually what I brought up is what's called PTCAS, so it's physical therapy. I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but this actually has the majority of all the schools for physical therapy, if you're interested in occupational therapy, it's just OT, CAS. What they do is they're listed out by state. So if I went and clicked on a particular school in California that I wanted, so let's just say Chapman University. Every school has the basic kind of same prerequisites, but each school is gonna be a little bit different. So they're gonna talk about what exactly you need to get accepted into that school. If you, go, if you scroll up a little bit, uh, Nathan, were, were the G, the, is that the average accepted or is that the, that's prerequisite, huh? So Chapman actually has, what they have is actually an early decision. Okay. Where all, as far as I know, the majority of all schools, as long as you have a cumulative GPA of 3.0 or above, you can apply to the school. For certain schools, they have like a separate category where if you have a 3.5 or above, your application is put in a separate category and they're gonna look at those first. So I know Chapman, it's called their early admission process. If you have a cumulative and prerequisite GPA of 3.5 or above, you qualify for that early admission process. So that's the early admission for Chapman and the GRE scores to go along with it? Correct. And do almost all the other programs have some of that early admissions or is that is that uh, unique that Chapman has that. As Let's kind of look I'm at sure it. there's going to be a few others that okay. have that. I That's new to me. I haven't seen that before. That. But even when I was applying to school, I know Chap I can use Chapman because I remember from me physically looking at Chapman. They've got it. This. Okay. I know there are a few other schools. That would be something where you have to go to this website and kind of look at the different schools. But if you just scroll down on the web page, it tells you all of the courses that you need to take. So here you need to take your anatomy, what biologies you can take, your chemistry, your physics, 
your physiology, your sciences, and they list out all the acceptable classes. And you guys could probably use assist.org with that too to see. And then the other recommendation that I'd have, and you can maybe echo this, Nathan, if you agree, is that um, I would email the school itself. So if you've taken statistics and you're not sure that the statistics that you took is going to meet their prerequisite, I would really strongly recommend that you try to get that in writing because that might be something that you want to dig up when they say, okay, no, 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 we couldn't consider your application because you didn't take the right statistics and you want to having some of that proof rather than just the administrative assistant over the phone saying, yeah, it's okay. And certain, for example, statistics classes, certain schools might accept a particular statistics class where other schools might not. So for example, for physics I know, I can scroll up, but certain schools will require a calculus-based physics where other schools will just require an algebra-based physics. You know, it's interesting too with that is I don't remember taking a calculus-based physics, and I think that now the standard is for most of the DBT programs that you take a calculus-based physics. Again, it depends. I know. And yeah, I mean, I just know from the kids that are applying right now, and it's it's hard too because calculus-based physics is is much more challenging, I think, than. And I know some programs have gone back and forth where when I was looking at a certain programs had calculus and they kind of teeter totter depending on the year whether they're accepting calculus or oh, algebra based. Um, so basically, I just wanted to kind of talk about what it takes to get into physical therapy school or occupational therapy school because I think if you're like, oh, I have my mindset on PT school, well, you need to look at all these prerequisites. You're going to need a course in anatomy, a course in physiology, a minimal of a year in chemistry, a minimum of a year in biology, a minimal of a year in physics, plus a minimum of a year of psychology, in addition to your bachelor's degree before you can even apply to physical therapy school. So I think it's better off knowing what it takes to get into school now rather than saying, oh, I'm going to go to PT school and then halfway down the road, oh, I didn't know that there's this many prereqs I have to do. I don't have the time and maybe don't want to do that and then steer towards another route. I think it's better knowing up front. Yeah, so I'll echo that one too with you guys and that's one of the reasons that um, some of you that are still, most of you that are still working on your GE and are still, you know, I think that we've got a couple in the class that have their bachelor's degree, but you really want to map things out um, if you're planning on going to a graduate program you need to map out what's required in that graduate program so that you can act sort of accordingly in your undergraduate program. You don't really want to wait until you finish your undergraduate program to say, okay, now what's needed with that? Um, and that's sort of like in your career transfer paper, I'm making you look at both of those steps so that right now hopefully you're taking or you at least know what courses are expected of you that you can do that right now here at Saddleback, wherever you transfer to as a four-year institution, so that when you apply to the master's or, or DPT programs, um, then you'll have those ones done. It's hard to think that far ahead of time. I can't think that's tomorrow half the time. Go ahead. Well, even what I did is because I went to Cal State Fullerton and got my degree in kinesiology with exercise science, but at the Cal States, zero to six units is one price, and then six units or above is another price. So if you take seven units, you're paying the exact same amount as you would if you're taking 15 units. So what I personally did is a lot of these science courses, like your chemistry and your physics, those are going to be five, six unit classes. I would take six units over at Fullerton, and then I'd take one of my prerequisites here. So then that way, you don't necessarily have to move, and you can just commute to, for example, Fullerton or Long Beach or whether it's UCI or somewhere like that, where you can just commute there and still take some of your classes here to help save on some tuition as well. Nate, what did you find as far as, um, was Fullerton taking some of those GE classes, the chemistry, physics, even non me physiology, was it more challenging there or was it more challenging here or kind of dependent on the instructor? It's more challenging here. Is it really than it was at Fullerton? Beyond more challenging. Really? Wow. You know, see, because I, 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 and because when I, and I wonder too. I'd have to ask this with some of the the UCI students that we, because we have a lot of interns right now from UC. We get three or four every every semester, but doing the science prerequisites 
where I went to do my undergrad at UCSD would have been much more difficult. Um, and I know that, I mean, I pretty much know that because I took some of those classes, but then I went back and took some of the community college and it was much easier at the community college than it was at the, the four years. So that's interesting. It's just something I, I, I usually, I haven't heard that one before. Most of the time for most community colleges, I would agree with you. However, Saddleback is very well known for not just their sciences, but their math and, and sciences in particular, for being way more challenging than the universities. I can physically tell you this because I know the professors that teach the anatomy and physiology courses at Cal State Fullerton. I worked with them as a TA. I am also a TA here at Saddleback. So I'm in the LRC. I actually tutor anatomy and physiology for the classes here and at IBC. And I will tell you here how much more it's a lot harder. I know oh, you went to Cal State Fullerton too. Okay, huh, interesting. Oh. It's, I would, the physiology here was, I would even say, 30 to 40% more challenging and more coursework work, work than my graduate school physiology class. Huh, they huh. prepare you more here. With that, they, I okay. Think they prepare you more here. That's interesting too, because my experience was that uh, the graduate school stuff blew doors on, on anything. It was, I mean, but I, it was, I think some of the time we're talking about specific instructors and the way that they do things, but we had some, um, in the graduate program, we had some anatomy and physiology instructors that really were, they weren't PTs, they were just specialists in it. And so then the way that we, the amount of detail that we looked at it in graduate school was, was you know, it's like, no, we're not gonna, ever need to know this amount of detail. Right. That, but I think it says a little bit more about the instructors. That's very smart, I would say, though, too. And I did a little bit of that, too, because I would say anatomy was didn't come as easy as physiology. And so I TA'd a lot of classes while I was in graduate school. And it really helps to build your foundation, especially in areas that you're not as strong in. I imagine, like, if you've taken and, and you TA'd for anatomy and physiology in all these undergraduate places, then you're going to be that much more prepared for the graduate work. I am currently just, for example, when I took pharmacology, which is basically just a physiology, just understanding in full detail, I basically had to tutor my entire class for physiology, and I knew the majority of it just from me tutoring and being a teaching assistant at Fullerton in here. So it's Physical therapy school and occupational therapy school, the hardest semester is going to be your first semester. Not necessarily because of the conceptual concepts of the material, but it's the amount of workload and the time you need to spend memorizing certain things. So for anatomy, there's just no way around it. You need to know where every muscle is, what your origin insertion, what your muscle action is. That's what you learned in anatomy here. When you get into grad school, you're going to take that to the next level. Plus, now you need to know all these little nerves and arteries and veins that you never learned in the hand or in the foot, in addition to your anatomy courses that you already took. And that's, again, on top of another 10 units that you're going to be taking in addition to that class. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just trying to let everyone know like that's the reality of it. Yeah, the general consensus, too, with in if I could speak to like what I've seen with other folks is the first year of the graduate of like a three-year graduate program is the most challenging um, in that you're doing a lot of the basic sciences at that time and for most folks um, it's harder to take the basic science courses than the, the, the clinical practice classes and so the trend is that if you can get through that first year of courses it's going to be smooth sailing after that, but that certainly, in my experience and the experience of some other close folks, is generally you know, every now and then you get the exception of like you get someone that's that the anatomy and physiology comes easier than uh, than say the clinical practice of geriatrics or something like that. But usually it's the clinical classes are easier and you're kind of smooth sailing after that first year because they're based upon your anatomy and physiology. So then it takes your anatomy and physiology and you learn what particular nerve innervates a particular muscle and what that muscle action does. And then if a person is weak in a particular motion from your anatomy and physiology, you then go, okay, this person is weak in this motion, what muscles then are potentially damaged or injured or what nerves are injured, and then you can develop a diagnosis or a rehab 
protocol from it. So that's why that's your foundation. So I would definitely highly recommend your anatomy and physiology. In all your neuro courses, any musculoskeletal courses, almost the majority of your courses in PT school are always going to be your reviewing anatomy. So, so then maybe besides um, your experience here with the adapted um, P program and, and the one at IVC, what other clinical experience, where else had you worked or volunteered at as an aide before applying? So I also worked at an outpatient physical therapy, which is pretty easy to get a job. Um, most outpatient physical therapists, um, as long as you at least have some have taken some classes in kinesiology and anatomy and physiology, they will hire aides. So what you do as an outpatient physical therapy aid is you're gonna help set up patients and hook them up and wrap them with ice or heat, or you're gonna hook them up with STEM, so to kind of help with pain management. You will also assist them with some certain exercises, uh, but basically you're under the direct supervision of a physical therapist, and the physical therapist is gonna tell you exactly what to do with that patient. They will still be, you know, overseeing everything and in line watching you, but you're basically just gonna hook them up on all the modalities and then help them and assist them with their exercises. So definitely, um, I would definitely recommend getting some outpatient experience, but especially here working with the different populations. Um, do you still have the high school kids that come over? Um, we don't have, we have some that are actually here in this class from oh, the nice. ROP program, um, but we don't have any, are you asking about high school students as helpers or as students? As students. Yeah, so that, that group, they're actually post high school. They're 18 to 23, and so we still have about half, almost half the population we serve is that adult transition population. Good. So I would recommend keeping and getting more experience with that, because like I said, when you're applying, not just a PT school, OT school, nursing, PA school, you want to separate yourself. So working with those different populations, you're not going to see that all in outpatient physical therapy. You're going to see mostly, you know, your ACL, maybe some neck pain. You might get a geriatric in here or there, but you're not going to be seeing all the neurological patients, the traumatic brain injury patients, the patients with multiple sclerosis or other specific pathologies that you would see volunteering here in this program. And you won't have that great instructor that, that gives really good lab blog book comments back to you. Um, there's what, what outpatient clinic did you work at, and was it volunteer or was it a paid experience for you? So I worked at Focus Physical Therapy in Rancho Santa Margarita. It was a paid experience. Um, I do know that some clinics you have to work there as an intern first before you can actually get a paid job. Um, there are so many outpatient physical therapy clinics so that you can just get a job that's a paid job rather than a volunteer. So that would be my recommendation is why not at least get paid while you're getting some of that experience. Where did that come along for you too? Was that, um, had you already worked with the adapted program and taken some of those classes and had that on your resume? Yes, you? yeah, so I already worked with the adapted uh, kinesiology population. Um, I worked at one other chiropractic slash PT office and I was just finishing up my bachelor's degree when I got my first job in my outpatient physical therapy setting as an aide. So they do want some experience. You have to at least be taking classes or working toward an exercise science degree or kinesiology degree or have taken at least anatomy and physiology because I do know some of the outpatient clinics when they're training you, they'll actually give you a handwritten exam and a physical exam where they want to make sure that you know, you know, if I tell you to do this exercise, that we're performing the right exercise and that the patient's doing it correctly. You know, patient safety is number one, so if you're working as an aide, you need to know what the exercise actually is and you need to be able to watch the patient to see like any major abnormalities with that movement pattern. And then obviously if you see an abnormality with that, you know, you can refer them to the physical therapist and kind of say, hey, I kind of noticed this when they were doing that. I'm not quite sure how to correct it, but I know that didn't look right. That's kind of your job as the aide in addition to wrapping them up with ice and stem, but patient safety and making sure they're performing the exercises properly. You know, I think that um, like since I was in, in your guys' seats, as far as it goes, it has gotten more challenging to get PTA work. Yeah. Um, so I would say, 
upon conclusion of this class, um, it wouldn't be a bad idea even while you're taking anatomy to start to get put feelers out there, really. And um, I don't think that I've talked to you guys about this necessarily in class, but it's always best to, especially in this day and age of the internet, that you physically go in and drop off um, something at, you know, and, and it's one of those things I joke about, like if you ask 10 girls to the prom, one's gonna say yes, right? And so it's been a couple days, ask a bunch of those folks to the prom with you, right? And then what you do, um, and this is real sort of practical advice, is that if they take your, your, your resume and your cover letter, um, take a business card and then follow up a week later with a phone call of, you know, hey, this is Kiefer, just wanted to make sure that, um, that you got my resume and you leave a message and then leave it up to them. Um, but that's, I think the in-person, when I did it, it's funny too, because it was pre-internet, it was a phone book. Um, and I used a phone book and I was in Fresno and I was like, okay, this is where I live, here's the five closest outpatient centers here and this is where I'm taking my classes and I'm gonna ask, you know, the, and I, I actually got a couple of jobs out of that, but that's really something that, um, that I would advise you guys to maybe even get a start on even earlier than, than Nathan did with that too. Um, the other thing I think that uh, the students here will find valuable is your letters of recommendation. I think I wrote you one. Um, so how did you develop relationships and where did those letters of recommendations come from? So that kind of came with obviously performing well in your classes. A majority of professors, if they're writing a letter of recommendation, they want to at least have seen you for two semesters. They'll write you a letter if you just, you know, got an A in one of their classes, but there's different standards of the letter, so they don't really know that much personal information about you, so they'll just kind of write a generic letter. But if you did well in multiple courses, or let's even say you only took one per course with that professor, but then became a teaching assistant for that class, then you get to know that professor personally, they're going to write you a much more detailed letter of record. Yeah, I bet your TA experience really came in handy that way. Then to In addition, a lot of professors, especially that teach your anatomy and physiology, they have a lot of pull at these universities and they know some individuals who are higher up. So it won't hurt to help be a TA and take those classes once or twice, have two classes with the same professor and do well in those classes. Yeah, you know what's interesting with that is that I found like recently, even though I have relationships with faculty at a couple different programs, is that a lot of times the numbers, and I'll just speak specifically about Chapman and Long Beach, is they don't really care if you have a relationship with them or you can vouch for them and stuff like that, but if you're not in the ballpark, in that sort of three five ballpark then it doesn't you know um but i you know there's developing relationships always can help you you heard renee talk about how she's sort of kept track of the uh, kept in touch with the professionals who she's had to maybe kind of go back and ask questions to so you always want to leave sort of things in good standing and it's never going to hurt that you have a anatomy instructor that calls over to a colleague of theirs at Chapman or Cal State Long Beach and says, hey, you know, I can really vouch for the student. You know, I give them a, a B, but they got really a B plus and they're really going to be solid and stuff like that. So those things can really, I think, they can. I, I have not, like, I, there's been a couple students of ours who have been lower than that, sort of, they've been closer to a 3.0 than a 3.5, haven't gotten in, and the, the faculty that I know just say, hey, it doesn't, you know, if we're getting two, 250 applicants and they all got at least three fives, we're not gonna look at the three two. Right. Mm -hmm. So Mike is 100% correct on that. But let's also use the flip side, what if you were at that three four mark and it's between you and three or four other students? And then you have that recommendation and they kind of have a pull and that professor can say, hey, I know this person's working hard, or let's even say later on in the future, after you go to school, well, that professor that you've worked with prior, they might have a job opening, and it's just all about the connections that you meet. Or that particular person, um, I know the previous individual who was up here speaking, what if you have a patient and that patient, you need to refer them to a particular specialist? Well, that you know professor that you worked with, they might be a hand specialist or a knee specialist or an ankle specialist, and that way you can develop the connections and be able to refer that patient to the most appropriate clinician that 
it's kind of dust. So. Your letters of recommendation, Nathan, came from at least one needed to come from a physical therapist, one from uh, a professor and instructor, right. and then what was, is there, there's usually three, is it? It varies by the school. So when you look at this website up here for the PTCAS, the school will tell you, like we can even scroll down here, of what your third or fourth letters of recommendation will be required. Some will be from an additional professor, some will be from a physical therapist, others you have the option to choose. But that will be listed on this website underneath the specific school on how many letters of rec, who they need to come from, um, how many observation hours that you need, all of that stuff. Yeah, bringing um, like your instructor's coffee on their birthdays and stuff like that, you know, or remembering what now in this case. It's his birthday, by the way. <laughs> there's, uh, it is. There's coffee. Uh, so I know I'm directing this a little bit for you, but we've got GREs up there too. And did most of the programs that you were looking into, Nate, require GREs? And did you have any advice on how students might prepare to to do well? As far as I know, all graduate programs need the GRE. You know, there's a couple that don't, and that'll probably show up on the PTCAS. And I yep. know that just, and maybe it's changed, but I've worked with clinicians that applied to particular programs in the past because they didn't want to have to take the GRE. And that may not be the case, it may be a decade old, but I still think there might be a couple out there that allow you to get by without doing the grad. And the GRE is essentially the SAT for graduate school. Yep. So yeah, that might be the case. I was just referring to all the schools that I looked up in California. So let me rephrase that. All of the major schools in California will require the GRE. Um, so for the GRE, like Mike said, it's basically the SATs, but basically it should have been everything you learned in college. So there's going to be an English portion and there's a math portion. The math portion is not going to go any higher than geometry. The English portion is just like if you took English 1B here, but it's more focused on reading paragraphs and kind of picking up the meaning of that paragraph. The best way to study for the GRE, oh and there's also a writing portion with that as well. The best way to study for the GRE is to go to the actual ETS testing website. That's the company that puts on the GRE. It's ETS, Educational Testing Services, I believe is the acronym. They have practice exams and listed on their website. They have all of the materials and what areas you need to focus on for the exam. And all of the materials, all the practice exams, the two practice exams are free resources. There are other outside companies, just like with the SATs, where you can go and purchase something for like $100 and you can take courses for the GRE, but what is exactly on the GRE for the material you need to know, you want to gather that from the ETS website. All of the supplemental courses, they're going to cover the majority of that material, but it's not specific to what exactly the GRE might be. The ETS is like the company that creates the website, or the exam. So that the ETS, I think it's .org, they list out everything there, and that's actually where you go when you schedule your examination. Most students, typically, it will vary, but depending on how comfortable you feel with math and English and writing, most students will average about three to six months of preparation for the GRE. So in addition to your classes that you're taking, you want to devote a little bit of time each week and kind of think of it as a class where you want to study for your GRE. A lot of programs will look at the GRE because they think that's a good indicator and predictor of how well you will do in physical therapy school or OT school. A lot of what they actually emphasize now is what I've been hearing from students is actually the writing score. And the reason for that is physical therapists and occupational therapists you do a lot of documentation and you have to be fast with your documentation. So they want you to be able to write, think on your feet, be able to just create sentences, write sentences kind of off the top of your head. What, I know I was kind of all over the place, but what questions do people have for me about PT school, applying, being in the program, how I got here, just anything in general? 
Did you apply to multiple programs, Nathan, or did you have your heart set on the one that you're that you got into? I actually only applied to the University of St. Augustine um, for a few reasons. Reason number one is they were the only program, as far as I know, at least on the West Coast, that offered the we'll call it part-time program or flexible program. So that allows me to have some free time, like today to come in to speak with you or to do any of my free activities where my classes the majority of them are delivered online so I just kind of have to go at my own pace and then on weekends and a couple days during the week I would have to physically go down to campus so that was reason number one reason number two is the University of St. Augustine allowed for my second biology class a substitution where I could have taken exercise physiology for my second biology course as part of my undergraduate degree, exercise physiology was a requirement, so I just basically killed two birds with one stone. How, how long will it take for you to graduate in the, in the part-time? The part-time program is four years. The full-time program for most schools is typically... Three to three and a half? It's three to three and a half. Um, you would have to look on this website now because I do know that the American Physical Therapy Association, they just now are requiring an additional internship. So some schools are requiring you to go an additional semester now relative to when I got accepted to school. So that would just be something you'd have to look into. But most programs are about three to three and a half years. The St. Augustine one now is two and a half. So that's the accelerated program. Huh, okay, so you're not, so four years isn't really that much longer than than most programs out there. And then how many weeks of clinical rotations do you have to do in the program right now? And how many are the new folks having to do those that are just now getting in the program? So right now, I believe I need 24 weeks of internship. So, but as the previous person who just came in here, I know one of the last questions was, hey, did grad school prepare you for actually working in real life? And the answer was, you know, it gave you the foundation, but realistically you gain more experience from actually working hands-on with individuals and, you know, actually working. So that's why they just created and they wanted to add an internship because they realized the value of actually getting a hands-on experience is that's where you learn a lot of your information. You know, learning from a textbook and practicing on a student is one thing, but actually going in real life and working with a patient and getting hands-on is a totally different experience. Do you know what they bump that up to? From is so from 24 weeks, do they bump it up to 32, 36, 28? I want to. Is it very little bit? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And generally, what happens, and and it, you're probably a little bit. I don't know. Are you getting into? Have you done any long clinical rotations yet? So each clinical rotation is that I do is only going to be eight weeks, and then you do a clinical rotation in an acute rehab facility or a home health facility. Your next clinical rotation is going to be in an outpatient facility, and then your third is kind of could be geared to what you wanted to go into, or maybe a neurological or a home health or something a little bit different. So, so it could be your, peds, or it could exactly. be orthopedics, or or some sort of specialty. Like yeah. so, it's interesting they tag the home health. It could be home health or acute. That's probably smart too, because it's pretty hard for them to get acute sites right now. So okay. Yeah, that's with all the competing with all the other schools. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys have any questions? How are, um, how are the courses like online? Is it the same as like It depends on the professor. So certain courses they will give you the exact same information, and certain courses will actually videotape the lecture. Okay and then you can watch it as many times as you want. However, some professors and some courses do not have that. So some of the courses, if they have all that information, I love those. But then those that don't have the video recordings of the lecture or the PowerPoint, those are going to be more of the classes where they just want you to read the book and kind of learn the information on your own. Same thing kind of with the courses here. But I do know a lot of the graduate school program now and physical therapy school programs, for financial reasons, they're putting a lot of their basic courses online now. The same with Chapman, USC, all the major schools, they're putting a lot of them online just for financial reasons.
Thank you, Nathan, for yeah. taking your time off your busy schedule. Did you get those plan of cares in? To, um, to still like one, yeah. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, gang, I, let's run over to the eight, the athletic training room real quick and see if Brad's still in there. And then we'll, uh, we'll be uh, done for the day. Should we take a with us? Yeah, please do.